Good morning. It's a privilege and honor to be with you this morning. Appreciate Dr. Spence. He was with our Dean Burke on Society meeting last July. I hope he'll be back next July as well. I'm glad you have these before you. And he told me I have 55 minutes. So I have allotted about four minutes per page. Got my stopwatch up here. Let's start right now. The Bible's first question is, Yea, hath God said. It's a devil's question. The devil's been questioning the words of God for the every since he was be created being, as old Lucifer who fell from heaven. Now these are slides from overheads that go down the page. One, two, three, down, and then the right, one, two, three, down. The second question in the Bible is a question to Adam. Where art thou? I'd ask it of each one of you. I praise the Lord that this is a remnant college and seminary, as our church is, the Bible for the Baptist Church in Collingswood, New Jersey, as our Dean Burke on Society is for 40 years. I've been the president of it, standing faithfully for every word of the living God. I praise the Lord for a church and a school that does the same. Uh, Psalm 11, 3, the key verse, let's say it together. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The foundation of all Bible doctrine is the Scripture. Wrong Scripture, wrong doctrine. Very important. We have to have a good foundation. In chapter 1 of my book, this, these are from the book tables out there, and the book that I wrote, the first book on this whole subject, is called In Defense of the King James Bible. So I go about chapters in my book, <laughs> look at it over there. God's Word is kept intact as Bible preservation. That's the Bible's timelessness. Uh, and the timelessness of the Scriptures, preserved from the very beginning, whether it's the Hebrew, Aramaic, and the Old Testament, Greek and the New Testament, God has promised Bible preservation. The timelessness of the Scripture never wears out, never goes bad, don't need any more translations, any more updates. Many hundreds of translations, English, Spanish, French, German, Italian, Russian, all these different languages. The Bible is preserved, as mentioned this morning, Hebrew, Aramaic, Old Testament, Greek, New Testament, the foundations in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, Old Testament. And as he said this, this morning in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture, passa grafe, all scripture, passe uh, grafe, written down, theanosos, theos God, phanestos breathed, God breathed. He breathed out the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. We stay with those texts, the Bible of preservation. In Psalm 12, 6 and 7, the words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them. People deny the preservation of the word of God, deny that God has the power, the omnipotence to preserve and keep his words. God shall keep them. Thou, thou shalt preserve them. This generation forever. If a generation is 20 words or 20 years or 30 words, thousand generations would be 20,000 years, 30,000 years. No question. We don't give up on God's preservation of Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek words. And verses on Bible preservation, Matthew 5, 18, from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Well, I'll turn the page over and you see what is the jot and the tittle. The jot is like a yo. That's the Hebrew word, letter yo, the tiniest little letter. The jot is just that dot. That's one of the higher critical marks in the Hebrew text. It's an abbreviation at the top of the Hebrew letters. And the jot or tittle shall be Pass away to all be fulfilled. If the tiniest, smallest letter, the Hebrew text will never perish. 
What about all the words, the big words, the big words in Hebrew or Aramaic or Greek? Matthew 24, 35, the Lord Jesus again, heaven and earth shall pass away. Many people don't believe that. They think it's eternal. No, God says it's going to pass away. But, the word for but there is the strongest Greek negative in the Greek language. But my word shall not, ume, that's the strongest word right there, ume, never, never, never pass away. That's God's promise. Never changes, don't have to add, subtract, or change. And God keeps his promises, like men, not like many of us. When we promise to take one another in marriage, for example, to death us to part, do we mean it? Many people don't. My wife and I have meant it for 70 years. How is that possible? We love each other. We promise before God in our marriage to do that. God promises to keep his words. Do we always agree? No. Two people never always agree. But do we patch things up when we disagree? Yes. Disagree, get back together. Disagree, get back together. God promises, God the man that should not lie. He's not a man that should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent and change. Had he promised, shall he do it and he will make it good. He never fails to keep his promises and his word. And then uh, for over 1,500 years of Bible preservation, the Lord Jesus never questioned the Hebrew texts of his day. Luke 24, 44, after his bodily resurrection, he met the two on the road to Emmaus, and he talked to them about the three parts, the three divisions of the Old Testament. He spoke to them of the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms concerning me. He talked about those things, preserved words. I'm sure he talked to them about those words in Hebrew, the threefold part of the Hebrew Old Testament. Law, prophets, and psalms. That's the superiority of the King James Bible. There's four different places. In fact, I titled my book, Defending the King James Bible, Defense of Three Different Areas, Superior Texts of Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, Superior Translators, Superior Technique of Translation, Verbal equivalents, formal equivalents, not dynamic equivalents like the new versions, and superior theology. In chapter 2 of my book, I go into that because the superior original language texts. First, the superior Old Testament Hebrew text. Now, tomorrow evening, I'll be talking about the two types of Greek texts, all we, both of them beginning with the letter A. Antioch is a good text all the way down. And Alexandria, Egypt is a bad text all the way down. But I'm just going to have a brief synopsis of all these things. And I may repeat myself tomorrow night in more detail when I talk about explicitly the Greek text. But first, the superior Old Testament text. In Romans 3, verse 1 and 2, God wrote through Paul, What advantage then had the Jews? What profit the circumcision? Much every way unto them were committed the oracles of God. Only the Jews. Now, I want people, people say, well, maybe Luke wasn't a Jew. I believe he was a Jew. Every one of the ones who authored the scriptures were Jews. I say authored, I mean wrote down the scriptures. In John the Gospel, he says, I have yet many things to say unto you, he told the apostles, the Lord Jesus. Cannot bear them now, how be it? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. He shall not speak of himself or from himself as to the source. Whatsoever that he shall hear, that shall be given to you. The Lord Jesus Christ is the author of every word of the Bible. Old Testament, New Testament. Though he gave the Holy Spirit the words, every word. The Holy Spirit gave to the human writers of that. And he's the author. Under them were given the oracles of God. The result of the care of the Jewish guardians Preserved Hebrew words. Uh, we have the real Old Testament, the one which the Lord had had and which was originally given by inspiration of God. We talked about inspiration this morning, but let's do it very good indeed. Now there are two Hebrew texts. Two Hebrew texts. Always, there's always the true and the evil, the bad, the true and the false. 
the true Hebrew text is a traditional Masoretic text, Daniel Barberg edition is called, Second Great Rabbinical Bible is called, edited by Ben Chaim, 1524-25. John questioned Hebrew text for the next 400 years. No question, people believed it. No doubt. Uh, in Kittles 1906-1912, he used it, the Biblia Hebraica, Hebrew Bible. It's used in the King James Bible. Now the false text, the false text, an abridged, shortened Masoretic text from one Hebrew manuscript, the Leningrad Codex, B 19A or L, 1008 AD, edited by Ben Asher. And it's used in the Kittles 1937, Hebrew. He changed the Hebrew text, 1937. It's an abridged text, Biblia Hebraica. Now that text has in its footnotes 20 to 30,000 different Hebrew suggested words. 20 to 30,000 changes suggested. That's the one that gave us a Dallas Theological Seminary where I learned the wrong Hebrew text, the wrong Greek text. I was blind to these things for 15 years until I found the truth. 19 things used in the New International Version, for example, that changed the Hebrew words. None of these should change the Hebrew. Nothing should change the Hebrew words. Whether Septuagint, whether Conjecture, Syriac Version, a few Hebrew manuscripts, Latin Vulgate, Dead Sea Scrolls, Aquila New Testament, Sinaiticus, Pentateuch, quotation from Jerome, Josephus, the bridge Hebrew scribal tradition, the Biblia Hebraica of Kittel or Stuttgart, a variant Hebrew original reading, constantal reading, a marginal reading, constantal text divided differently, Symmachus, Hebrew Targums, Theodosian, Greek Old Testament, Juxta Hebraica, or the different set of Hebrew vowels. Nothing should change the Hebrew words. We're on target, let's move to the next page. <laughs> Four minutes. Our chapter two in my book, Defending the King James Bible, uh, deals with God, King James Bible, God's words kept intact in English. A lot of these people say inspired. No, it's not God breathed. It's not Theonostos. That's Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. But I use the term kept intact in English because it's accurately translated from the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek words kept intact, and superior New Testament Greek text. Now here's a chart. It's hard to read all the details of it, but there's the true origin, and of course the next slide is the false origin. And it starts with the 1950 Italia Bible, Peshitta Bible, Wycliffe Bible, uh, Italia Bible, Erasmus, Tyndale, uh, the Luther's Bible, Coverdale Bible, the Matthew's Bible, Geneva Bible, Stephen's, Bishop's Bible, Beza's Bible, King James Bible, all those with the dates are the true source of our King James Bible, the true source. The false source, the false texts all originate in false and fake beginnings, uh, starting with Vatican and Sinai. Now, the Sinai manuscript is a false manuscript. Dr. Jack Mormon, one of our church's missionaries in London, England, has written a book called Was Codex Sinaiticus Written in 1840? They claim it was written in 350 A.D. It's a false and fake claim. I think the same is true of the Vatican manuscript, but he's got the evidence. It's written in 1800. And they always say the oldest has to be the best, therefore we have to go back to the Vatican Sinai. I'm so glad for Dr. Jack Mormon and others who have written on this subject. It's a fake and phony date. Now I have at least four questions to ask every one of you. I hope you'll answer every one of them. First, would you put a fox in charge of your chickens? Well, I don't hear anything. Okay, no. Second question, would you put a thief in charge of your bank? I didn't hear it very loud, but I guess you believe it. Three, would you put a pedophile in charge of your children? 
Oh, that's great, I heard it. Would you put a heretics in charge of your Bible? But again, no. Well, Westcott and Hort were heretics. If there's the Greek text in the New Testament, they put in charge of their Bibles. And yet, Westcott and Hort deny the inerrancy of the original Greek New Testament. They wrote, little is gained in speculating as to the, the, the uh, precision, the precise date at which such corruptions came in. They may be due to the original writer. If they believe the original writer could have had corruptions, it means everything is, is off the table. The original writing of the whole New Testament in the Greek language, they're doubters. Notice the other thing about Westcott. He doubted biblical miracles. Writing in his diary, the dates that people are given, I never saw an account of a miracle except, uh, but I instinctively to feel improbability, starting with the miracle of the creation of God. All the other miracles of Scripture, these pagans, these false teachers, these apostates deny miracles. The miracle of the virgin birth, the miracle of the deity of Christ, the miracle of the bodily resurrection, all the miracles of Scripture, they say no. Why put those kind of people in charge of your Bible? I would never trust such a person as, as that. And then Westcott's denial of Genesis 1 to 3 as literal history. Randy Archbishop of Canterbury, no one now, I suppose, holds that the first three chapters of Genesis, for example, gives a literal history. I can never understand how history, and anyone reading it, would think they open the eyes and think that they could to do. So in other words, the Genesis creation, the fall of man, all these different things in Genesis 1 to 3, does not deny the history of Genesis. Now Hort, who was a co-author with Westcott, denied the literal Genesis fall of Adam was reasonable. That slide there tells about that. Historical character of the fall. If you didn't believe man fell, Adam and Eve fell, starting with Adam, uh, then all of us are fine. All I guess. If you don't believe in the fall, we haven't fallen, we're all right, we're up. Never fell down, never sinned. Probably Universalism is next. And then Hort denied the held of the truth of the origin of the species, our, our origins, re, uh, evolution. If you look at the stars and the skies and the ants and the birds and the bees and human beings and all these other things created, and constellations, what kind of fools could believe in evolution? What kind of ignoramuses could feel that God that this came, all these things just by accident, the trees, the shrubs, the flowers, everything. But yet, a wonderful origin of the species. I'm inclined to think it unanswerable, unanswerable. And then Westcott and Hort accepted the New Testament Greek manuscript B, above all others, the Vatican. They claim it's old, 350 AD, far exceeds all the other documents. Now, though Dr. Mormon has completely exed out the Sinai manuscript, claiming to be 350 AD, but really 1800s, it's not old, it's new. I'm sure they're working on this other one as well, as well as David Daniels also has written books on this. And he's also convinced that even the Vatican manuscript is also a fake and written earlier, or I mean much later. But these are things that are very clear indeed. Then the deviant origin of Westcott and Hort's B, or the Vatican text. B, capital B, is an uncial standing for the Vatican manuscript. Uh, and to judge the comments made by Clement of Alexander, who's a Gnostic, a leading Gnostic, he says, Every deviant Christian sect was represented in Egypt during the second century. Clement mentions all these different deviant sects, Valentinians, Basilians, all those are listed completely. Then, uh, he doesn't know in Egypt during the second century that anybody was orthodox. Not a single person in Egypt where all these false versions originated if it's an orthodoxy, then everything is tainted that came from Alexandria, Egypt, these Gnostics. 
And what's got North believe in the text of the Egyptian revision? Uh, those who said Westcott North text believe an Egyptian revision, current from 200 to 450 AD, and abandoned between 500 and 1881, merely revived in our day of the 1800s and stamped as genuine. You can stamp a piece of paper as a million dollars. Does that make it a million dollars? Stamped as genuine. It was false indeed. And then next page, modern Greek text, similar to the Westcott and North Greek text. All subsequent versions from the revised version, 1881, to those present have adopted their basic approach and accepted the Westcott and North Greek text as their basis. Everyone. That's why everyone is false. Well, that's English, French, German, Spanish, Italian, Egyptian, any of these other languages of the world that have adopted this text is also false as well. Modern Greek text, similar to Westcott text. Now, Dr. DeVitra is one of our speakers to be, our vice, one of our vice presidents for Dean Bergen Society. He wrote to Bruce Metzger in Princeton. Bruce Metzger is dead now, but they asked him, when you form these new Greek texts, these new types of Greek texts, these West Cotton Court types of texts, Nestle Island, N.A., United Bible Society, UBS, uh, how did you find those? How did you start? And he said, in writing, I have been writing in my files, Dr. Bruce Mesker, we took as our base at the beginning of text of Westcott and Hort, 1881. They all started with these fake and phony apostate heretics, satanic men that denied the, the forms of doctrine of the faith. Now in the book table, we have this book by Dr. Jack Mormon, 8,000 critical texts, Differences from the text of the 8,000 differences. Later on, we're going to see some lies told by supposed fundamental people. It's back there. It's a real thick book. And then the Vatican V and Sinai Aleph. Now, remember, Sinai Aleph is not 350 AD. It's 1800. It's not old. And uh, Dean Bergen didn't know that when he wrote these things, and others didn't know that. But it's been exposed now by many men. And... The difference, Vatican sign a difference, 3,000 places in the Gospels alone, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Which is right? If A is right, B is wrong. If B is right, A is wrong. Aleph is wrong. They both could be wrong. They certainly are both wrong in many places. Now, New Testament manuscripts. Notice the papyrus, as of 1967, that's the manuscript that is very Passes away soon, 81 to 88. The number of manuscripts of Westcott and Hort are 13. Text receptors, 75. Percentages, 15% to 85%. Those are the manuscript percentages. Unchos, those are capital letter Greek letters. Capital letters, 367 of them. How many Westcott and Hort? Nine. How many text receptors? 258. What's the percentage? 3% versus 97%. Curses, those are small letter Greek words, small letter Greek letters. There's 2,764. How many Westcott North? 23. Text receptors, 2,741. Percentage, 1% to 99%. Lectionaries, those are the Greek New Testaments read in the, in the churches of the early church. There's 2,143. How many for the Westcott North? Zero. How many for text receptors? 2,143 percentages, 0% to 100%. The totals of the 5,255 manuscripts a while back that we have, we have a few more now, only 45 are Westcott and Hort. There's Vatican and Sinai and 43 others. That's it. How many text receptors? 5,210 percentages, 1% versus 99%. And yet these new versions are based on less than 1% of the evidence. Anybody that takes 1% of the evidence over against 99% is a stark, raving man fool. Stark, raving mad. And that's what these apostates take. Right now, the chapter 3, King James Bible is God's Word kept intact in English because the superior translators 
The overall superiority of the King James Transfer. Few indeed, writes this man, McClure, few indeed are the living names, he wrote this in the 1800s, worthy to be enrolled with those mighty men. It would be impossible to convene out of any one Christian denomination or out of all of them translators on whom we could, the whole Christian community could bestow such confidence as are proposed by that illustrious company or would even prove uh, in themselves as deserving in such confidence. Not even prove. Superior translators. Excellent, excellent men. Chapter 4 of my book goes into the King James Bible, God's words kept intact in English because of the superior technique of translation. How you do it. Superior team technique, first of all. The teams that were used. The teams. And there's three different cities where they met. Westminster, Oxford, and Cambridge. Team technique, not used in all these other translations. The Westminster team, they translated Genesis to Second Kings, and New Testament, Romans through Jude. The Oxford team translated Isaiah to Malachi, New Testament, Gospels, Acts, and Revelation. Cambridge team, Old Testament, First Chronicles to Ecclesiastes. And then they translated the Apocrypha. Now, the Apocrypha is not part of the Bible, why did they put it in in 1611? Because Gim King James says, put it in. Well, all right, he's the king, we put it in. But they didn't put it in the Old Testament, they didn't put it in the New Testament, because the King James translators did not believe the Apocrypha Scripture. They put it in between. It's history. In fact, the Oxford, the Articles of Faith, Westminster Confession, specifically says, Apocrypha is not part of the canon of Scripture. And it didn't take very many years to throw that right out of the King James Bible. It's no longer in. Now they're putting it back into the King James Bible, some of them, and some of the translations. Sad to see. And so the superiority of the King James. And then chapter 4 uh, deals with the superior technique of translation. Superior translation technique, first of all. First of all, it uses the verbal equivalents formal equivalents, and rejects dynamic equivalents. These are the types of translations that he has. Now, we'll, we'll go a little, bit later, a little bit later, but the, the speaker this morning, Brother Wilson, talked about verbal equivalents. We'll see what that is. Turn the next page. We made it all right. We're on schedule and on time, no problem. Uh, what is verbal equivalent? They translate words from Hebrew and Greek into English. We've got to use that word. Uh, the words are important. It's used by the King James Bible, rejected by modern versions. Occasionally they had a word that's right, but they don't care about the words. It also uses, because dynamic equivalency doesn't matter about the words, they use formal equivalents. That is the forms of the words. Preserve word forms from Hebrew and Greek into English. Used by the King James translators, rejected by modern version. In other words, when it's an adjective in the Hebrew, put it in English as an adjective. The verbs to verbs, nouns to nouns, adjectives, all these things. And occasionally these new versions hit upon a word from the input, of it, but it's not their proper position on equivalence. Just use dynamic. Uh, and so the inferior translation technique of modern versions. They reject verbal equivalents. Once in a while, they had a, a word, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, into English, or Spanish, or French. Rejects formal equivalents. They switch it all the time, any time they want. Uh, and they use dynamic equivalents. Now, what is that? Well, dynamic. It's moving. It's not stat stable in status quo. It can add to God's words, which makes them deity. Any time you add to God's words, you're like God himself. Tremendous error, wicked sin. It subtracts from God's words, which is another sin. It can change God's words. This form of translation in the modern version, whether it's English, Spanish, French, German, any other language of the world, is wickedness and sinfulness and error. Dynamic equivalence. Well, I chose seven D words here. I have about 20 or 25, but my wife said, oh, that's too much. So I just wrapped it up in seven. Diabolical, using the Garden of Eden. 
devilish to add, subtract, and change God's word. Deceptive. People think it's all right, think it's there, and it's not there. That's deceptive. Determined. They're determined to add, subtract, and change. They're not always going to tell them otherwise. Not going to be literal like the, the King James Bible. His dishonest. Pretends to be God's word in the language, but it's not. Deifying a man makes man like God himself to change these things. Only God handles his word. Nobody's supposed to change it. Man, woman, or child. And it's disobedient. God says don't do it. They do it. And disapproved by God. Now, what is a legitimate translation? Well, according to the court quote that I make here, we want to know what God said. Not what God, Dr. So-and-so thinks God meant by what he said. And there's a great deal of difference between the two. And then the, these, are what, these are what people, and we intrude into holy ground when they ignore the difference. And that's a very important thing. It's got to be accurate. Now, what's the Bible's case against dynamic equivalence? Of well, the various verse, verses, let's read the first one together. Deuteronomy 4.2. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandment of the Lord your God, which I command you. That's God's command. Don't add, don't diminish or take away. That these new versions add and diminish. They don't care what God said. Then again, Amos 8, 11. Let's read that one together. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. That day is upon us. It's been here for hundreds of years when the men have translated and mistranslated the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek words into their languages. God told us to Amos, years and years and centuries before, famine in the land. And these false translators aren't through yet. Believe me, they're not. They keep coming out and out and out and out, changing, changing, causing more famine. And when the rapture of the Lord Jesus Christ takes place, I wonder if there'll be very many words at all that are accurate before the Lord himself. Famine in the land. Matthew 4 and verse 4, let's say that again. The Lord Jesus said, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Every word. The old devil tried to tempt our Savior for three different times. Wilderness, 40 days, 40 nights. He was hungry, turned the stones into bread. All these three testings and temptations of our Savior. He quoted scripture. He knew the Scripture because he wrote the Scripture, the author of Scripture, the one that knew it the best. When everything the devil had, he had an answer for I hope when the devil tries to test and tempt us, we'll have an answer from the Word of God to change and to quote every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God, every Arabic and Hebrew word, every Greek word proceeding out of his mouth by God's inspiration, God's breathing out. Then in Galatians 3.16, this Bible's against dynamic equivalence. Let's read that together. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He says, not into seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which was Christ. Even singulars and plurals, not to be changed. If it's plural in the Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, it's got to be in the language of translation, as our King James faithfully pronounces it does. Then in chapter 5 of my book, Defending the King James Bible, I say it's God's words kept intact in English because of superior theology. Doctrines, very, very important doctrines. Now there's some lies about the doctrinal differences in the Hebrew text. There's some lies. Now, Let's turn over, and there's two books, one from Bob Jones University, God's Word in Our Hands, and my answer to that, Fundamentalism and Questions on Bible Preservation. Uh, 
this, these, these lies, there's the lies, and they say lies among these people, aren't they wonderful at Bob Jones? Well, I've had two or three sons attend there, and some daughters, and daughters are not different. Years and years ago, it was one, one way. I wouldn't send anyone to that school, anyone at all of any kind. The president, I've got, a, I've got a contemporary Christian music background, and the music director of Bob Jones also has a contemporary Christian music uh, background, and he's teaching us. I used to have good hymns, wonderful hymns. Used to, what it used to be is not what it is today. And uh, probably CCM has taken over completely. Now, what are some of the lies about doctrinal differences? In misinformation about doctrinal differences, my book that I answered this, God's Word Kept in Our Hands, it's written by James Williams and Randolph Shaler, both connected with Bob Jones. From God's Word in Our Hands, a quotation 221, they say, Mark Minnick, who's one of the teachers there, wrote, but not a single variant in any way alters what Christian believes, which Christians believe, included in our Bibles, and everyone should be omitted, or everyone could be uh, 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 retained, it would not affect our faith or practice in the slightest way. Absolute, total lie. Now, there are two things that might be the cause here. Number one, they're ignorant of the truth. So they say nothing different in doctrine. Second, they could be liars. I wouldn't like to say of call them liars, but whatever they are, they're ignorant of the truth. All these things. Not a single doctrinal statement. There's another book I answered from Bob's University called Bible Preservation and the Providence of God. I answered that on Bob Jones University's questions on Bible preservation. Now notice what they say, some more lies. Uh, for instance, for Bible preservation in the Providence of God by Sam Schneider, who was one of the teachers there, professor head of the Hebrew department, in fact, and Ron Pietro. In fact, Sam Schneider came one day to one of the meetings I had in South Carolina, in Greenville, at one of our church, the churches there, Brother Rainey, Brother Rainey, uh, he may come here, I'm not sure. And uh, at the end of the service, Sam Schneider came up and said, uh, I've got a copy of your book, Dr. Waite, defending against you. I wonder if you make a sign, sign it for me. Is that sign it? Fine, that's fine. So he knows exactly what's in that book and it shows all the different doctrines of the faith completely. And yet he says in a statement, statement number 88, it cannot be stressed too heavily that not one textual variant affects even one single teaching of Scripture. Fully 100%, the critical Greek text is free from variants that alter doctrine. Either a total lie or total ignorance, one of the case. Totally false. You'd expect these people. If they're teachers, they ought to know the truth. If you don't know the truth, don't teach anything. Wait till you got the truth and teach the truth. And then uh, on page 163 of my answer, the statement 163, quote, if the most liberal of the critical eclectic scholars set out to begin an anti-KJV conspiracy group and consistently choose or chose the worst possible readings from his alternatives, no doctrinal changes would result. False. You see why I don't send anybody ever, ever, ever again to Bob Jones University to hear this? It's, it's a garbage falsehood untruth. False, completely. And then the truth about false doctrine, the worst Scott North text, there's a book by Dr. Jack Mormon, one of the missionaries from our church in London, England. I think it's out on the book table. It, it has 356 passages, almost 200 pages. Now notice, 200 pages. Or he lists some 356 doctrinal passages. Now last time I went to kindergarten, I knew that zero was different from 356. 
How about you folks? I guess in college you learned that, didn't you? Uh, yet these men from Bob Jones say not a single doctrine is affected. 356, right there. He gives the NIV and then the King James Bible and the manuscript evidence for each. Manuscript evidence. And shows 356 passages. Well, defending the King James Bible, book on the book table, so I wrote the superior texts, superior translators, superior technique of translation, superior theology, uh, superiority. Now, the early date of the New Testament heretical corruptions. Dean John Burgon, Dr. Spence said he's ordered three books of all the five books of Dean Burgon, tremendous scholar. He's the one that I read for the first time, graduating from Dallas Seminary, using the wrong Westcott and Hort Greek text. They gave it to us in the bookstore. Four years, the Master of Theology, one more year, five years at Dallas, the wrong Greek text. Did they tell you anything about the right text? Nothing. One side only of the argument. So I grew up for 10, 15 years, knew nothing but fake and false Greek text. Until a little girl from one of my schools, I was professor of Greek and speech at Shelton College, Cape May, New Jersey. She raised her hand one time. Little Sandy was her name. She said, Dr. Wake, do you know there's a book in our library by Dean Burgon? I said, no. He tells the right text. Thank you, Sandy. Immediately, I went 40 or 50 miles north to Princeton Theological Seminary. From their library, I got the book by Dean Burgon, the revision revised. I read it, converted totally to truth. I've always said there's only two types of people in this world. Those who, when confronted with truth, from confronted with truth, will discard error. The only other type of person, when confronted with truth, will retain their error. I'm the kind when I'm wrong, I admit it, I change the truth. I was dead wrong. Dean Burgon, he's an Episcopalian, I don't agree with that, but He's a, that's why we call the Dean Bergen Society. He knew the truth I changed. And he showed me these dates. And he showed me the truth in the text receptus was the way to go. The early date, the heretical corruptions, Dean Bergen said they came starting at the beginning with many things. At the beginning, they had the scriptures. And Alexander Egypt was a source of Gnosticism. He says they had the traditional text, but then they, the theology didn't go along with the traditional text. They had to change the text, add it, subtract it, and change. The early data knew heretical corruptions. Now these, Dean Bergen says, they're bent on correcting the verses of scriptures, and when they found their tenets refuted, they changed them. Now the influence of Gnosticism of Bible versions. There's an important book we have in our bookstore, if you're interested, all Gnostic quotations from Gnosticism, the doctrinal foundation of the New, T New Bible versions by Mrs. Janet Moser. She's with the Lord now, 235 large pages. And she's researched the Gnostic theology. Doesn't agree with it, but she researched all the Gnostic theology to see what they say. Here are some of the doctrines that the, the Gnostics teach. Where did they get the Gnostic heresies? They originated from the headquarters of Gnosticism, Alexandria, Egypt. That's the source. I believe myself that Westcott North's false Greek text came from Alexandria, Egypt, came from these Gnostic, horrendous Greek manuscript texts. Now here's some of their theology. Notice for its Gnostics tonight that sinlessness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, for instance, on page 93 of the book, she quotes, Jesus had a sin nature, like every other man. False heresy. Page 180. Redemption includes Jesus Christ. He needed to be redeemed. False theology. Page 83. Joseph, not God, was the father of Jesus. False theology. Deny the, the eternal, the, the birth and son of Jesus Christ. Then the Nazis deny the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. On page 80, they say Jesus was not God incarnate, did not have all of God's attributes. On page 80, 
62, the term Lord refers to the Father, not to Jesus, denying his deity. Page 63, the Son is not equal to the Father, denying his deity. Page 87, Jesus is not the Lord God Almighty, deny his deity. They then deny that Jesus and Christ were the same person. They split him up. It's not Jesus Christ. And on page 95, Christ is separate from Jesus. And on page 97, Notice the Christ, that's the deity, the age, well, he was deity. The Christ came upon Jesus at his baptism in order to enlighten and perfect him, left him before he died. Jesus Christ, not one person, one God again. Then the Gnostics deny that Christ is the only way of salvation. Lucifer is the Savior. That's page 33. These are Gnostic teachings. Satan is the Savior. On page 106, the Savior did not die on the cross, but rather another Jesus who was demon-possessed. Another denying his way. Page 162, man is saved by the symbolic death of Christ within man, my brother, not by the blood of Christ. Page 167, man is saved by following the example of the Redeemer in obedience, saved by works. Gnostics deny that Christ is the only way of salvation. First on page 179. Redemption includes the angels, including Satan and his angels. Page 182. Redemption includes the whole world. In other words, universal salvation. Then on page 66, it says, God is the universal Father of all mankind. All mankind are his sons. Total, total lie and falsehood. On page 135, the devil is an instrument of God and will ultimately be pardoned. False, the old devil, I'm saying. Then Gnostics deny that salvation is instantaneous. On page 180, it says man is saved, perfected in stages. No, no stages. By grace he saves through faith immediately. For, let's say God 360 together. For God so loved the world. Say it together. That he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Have it right now when we truly trust from our hearts the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Not some stages. You hope at the end you're going to make it. No, immediately. And then they deny that these, they say man is saved by the following example of Jesus. In page 167, through the sacraments, 168 and 173, Saved by through, not through, through faith, but his own works, and not that of Christ. And then page, it denies the incarnation of God the Son. Uh, now the 16 of the 356 doctrinal passages changed by the Bible. 16. And let's just quote these first about deny salvation instantaneously. I guess we got that right. All right. Uh, for instance, in 1 Timothy 3.16, there's 356 doctrinal passages. I'm just quoting here 16 of them, just as examples. And I've got plenty of time. I'm pretty well on schedule. First of all, 1 Timothy 3.16. Let's say it together. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, Priesthood of the Gentiles, believed them in the world, received up into glory. That word God is changed to either hos or ha in the Greek, either who or which. The deity of our Savior is denied by these manuscripts and these doctrines. And yet these professors at Bajo University can lie through the teeth or at least be misinformed and say not a single, single doctrine is changed. Then let's go to 1 John 4, 3. The denial of the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's say it together. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God, and this is the spirit of Antichrist, which ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. Now, Vatican Sinai, here's the Sinai Aleph again, which is fake and phony. It's 1800, not 356. They take out those words, Christ is come in the flesh. That's the incarnation. 
God the Father sent God the Son into the world. God the Son was willing to come. He came to seek and to say that which was lost. But he was incarnate. They take out Christ coming to the Father. Because the Gnostics didn't believe it. Then Matthew 1, 25, the denial of the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus. Let's say it together. And knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Notice the V and I'll take them out in these new versions, NIV, NASV, and New King James, all the modern versions. <clears throat> firstborn, well, he had many uh, half-brothers, half-sisters, but firstborn, his virgin, the virgin birth of Christ, denied by all these modern versions. But the denial of the mission of Christ to save the lost. In Matthew 18 11, let's say that together. For the Son of Man is come to save that which is lost. It's omitted by these things, all these modern versions. That was his mission, to come to save the lost. Now that's an invitation, but that's not a salvation for the whole lost. He came to save the lost. The invitation is coming to me all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If you accept that invitation, the Lord Jesus does save your soul. If it's from the, not the head, the heart. But the invitation provided for all by zest only for those who believe. And then uh, <clears throat> in Luke 2, 22, the denial of the sinlessness of our Lord Jesus. Let's say that together. And when the days of our purification were according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. The Vatican Sinai, these two phony manuscripts and all new versions, they meant they changed the her to there. Why do I say that denies his sinless? Because the three people that were there was Joseph, Mary, and the Lord Jesus. If it says their purification, the Lord Jesus had to be purified. He was a sinner. Horrible, monstrous change. One single pronoun changes the theology that's vitally important. Then the denial of the truthfulness, truthfulness of the Lord Jesus. In John 7, 8, and let's say that together. Go ye up into this feast, I go run up yet into this feast. For my time is not full come. Just taking out one simple word, yet. He went up a few days later, and if he says, I know God up, he went up, that makes him a liar. It's a terrible thing. Then denial that Jesus is the creator. In Ephesians 3, 9, let's do that together. And to make all men see what the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus, by Jesus Christ is omitted. That's making him not the creator. All these modern versions take it away. My time is up, but let me read the last page if I can. John 8, 59. Let's say it together. Then they took up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the Tyrian temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Denial of the omnipotence of the Lord Jesus. I was a football player in high school. I started as a freshman backfield and fullback. Every time I got fullback straight through, I got tackled immediately, changed to tackle. But the Lord Jesus, if they deny going through the midst of them, they deny his omnipotence, all powerfulness. He couldn't go through this crowd that's ready to crucify him and kill him, take him to Calvary. Omnipotence of Christ. Denial that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. Second Corinthians 4.14, let's say that again. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up also by Jesus and shall present us with him. The by is changed to with. If with, he isn't raised today. If we're going to raise up with him, he's still dead. We've got to raise with him. No, by Jesus. Denial is power to raise the dead. And then the denial that Jesus uh, died as our substitute. First Corinthians 5.7. I'll say that together. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lamp, and ye are not leaven, for even Christ our Passover is sacrifice. Leave out for us. They leave it out in our behalf. Then you know that the gospel of Christ is God's power. Let's say it together. Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, 
For it is the power of God and salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Taking out of Christ, just the power. Well, the power of who? Of the devil, the red-nosed reindeer, a fairy tale, somebody else? Uh, no, the power of Christ. And then finally, the denial of Christ can strengthen the believers. Philippians 4, 13. Let's say that one together. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. He wrote that from prison. They leave out the one important word, Christ. Who's the one that can strengthen? The devil? Some, some other, some angel, somebody else? No, it's only in the Lord Jesus Christ can save and keep us whole again. My 55 minutes is exactly up. Let me just simply thank you for listening. Thank you for taking these notes. I'm glad they printed them out. I didn't read every word of them. You can take a look at them. Now, t- tomorrow night, I'm going to have not 50, see, not 68, 65 pages, but 68 pages. And the pages are bigger. So instead of four pages, you don't want to have to have two pages per. So tomorrow night, you've got to follow closely. Some will be repetitious because this is the overall picture. But I'm glad to be here. Let's close with a word of prayer. Our Father, we do thank Thee for Thy grace. We thank Thee for our Lord Jesus Christ who gave us every word of Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek words. We thank that we have it preserved and protected in, in our King James Bible. Proper, proper words. We ask Thee, Lord, for this school. We pray for this school. We thank Thee for it. We thank Thee for the president, the vice president, every one of the teachers, every one of the students those that are faithfully attenders of the church, guide them and direct them to stand firmly for our King James Bible, God's words kept intact in English. We pray for the present, all the faculty, everyone. Help us the rest of this day. In the Lord Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen.